Welcome to a new episode of the Life Science Get Together podcast with the recording today. Um, I started in the life science industry with drug development in 2006. So I think it's uh, almost or more than 15 years ago. And I came from other industries which were focusing on business to consumer and business to business um, in the value chain. And when I started out in the life science industry, um, let's say it was very challenging to find out how the value chain in the pharma industry works. And I believe uh, coming from the business side, it's an absolute must before starting a company uh, to know what's possible on the business side, which company structures exist in the industry, and uh, especially how financing is done and what possibilities are on the market uh, to uh, design an exit for the investors and uh, how companies can be developed. Uh, to answer that question, I have looked into uh, my network and I believe uh, one of the best experts in the field when it comes to developing life science companies is Christoph Langauer from Third Rock Ventures. Christoph, welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me. It's good to have you here. Uh, one, the first question from my end, Christoph, uh, how did you uh, start it in the life science industry and what are you doing with Third Rock Ventures? Uh, I mean, I'm originally from Austria. You can see that in my background. Um, Studied in Salzburg, then got my PhD in Heidelberg, Germany, um, in biology, and then was a, a postdoc at the IMP in Vienna. And um, then I had to make this big decision: should I actually stay in science or not? And I got really frustrated about like everything is so complicated and slow and like painful, you know, typical postdoc sort of um, trauma. And I said like maybe I, I should go to the US into the lab, what I consider the best lab in the world in oncology. And if I don't like it, then then like just forget it. And um, that's how I ended up at Johns Hopkins in the lab of uh, Bert Vogelstein. It's a lab where we together then I stayed there 12 years, uh, discovered some of the key oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes. And um, but publishing in Science, Nature, and Cell was kind of satisfying for a while. Um, but then to answer your question, I had this urge of saying, uh, can that also result in some form of medication or, or a test that have real impact in terms of like, yeah, um, real patients rather than just sort of inventing core principles. And that's how I ended up at Novartis, where I built a target identification validation group and then became global head of oncology for Sanofi. And that Big, big pharma experience, I think, taught me a lot, but real impact um, you can have as, you know, as a, in, in the biotech space and uh, became founding CSO of Blueprint Medicines. And we might talk about that later, um, which is now a public company and um, learn sort of this coming from a chief scientific officer perspective more and more into like, a successful company is about that interplay between science, medicine, and business. And I had an MBA also, which I got at Hopkins, with a focus on medical services management. And um, this entrepreneurial concept of founding ideas, uh, um, ideating projects that become companies fascinated me. And that's how I ended up as a partner at Third Rock where we actually only invest in companies that we ideate um, and uh, launch and build ourselves. So you basically know the industry from the scientific lab bench up to uh, Big Pharma and also the environment in between uh, when it comes to translating science into products and building companies, uh, which basically was my starting point in 2006 with a Novartis spin-out um, in the antibiotics field. And in the industry in the last couple of years, uh, especially in Europe since the, um, since the economic crash in 2008, I learned a term which was a special purpose vehicle. So it was very popular, uh, I think in the phase from 2008, around 2016 to 17, to focus in companies on moving a single asset forward. 
And I always wondered, are there other approaches uh, in the industry? You mentioned before Blueprint Medicines and uh, this company is listed on the market. Um, is this also a single asset company or uh, did you follow a different approach with that? Yeah, um, good question. I mean, Blueprint is now a five and a half billion dollar company. We just celebrated last week its 10th anniversary. I, to answer your question, uh, it's, I think it's like only the second company that from its initiation um, to its 10th year anniversary has uh, two drugs on the market mm -hmm. uh, approved that are self-made out of the company. Therefore, whenever we talk about single asset companies, uh, we need to be careful about what's the alternative, right? Because, um, and I'll introduce you to the alternative in a moment, but we need to keep in mind that Producing more than one, producing one <laughs> drug is difficult. Two is very difficult, and three is uh, close to impossible. And that's just uh, the context that we are living in. Mm -hmm. But at Surgery, we are not building companies that are single asset companies. Um, all our companies have this component of what we call a, a, a product engine. And the definition of a project and product engine is not necessarily a technology, but is much more a concept within the company that allows you to initiate and then pursue drug discovery programs over and over again. Um, to come back to Blueprint, um, part of its value lies also in the fact that um, uh, Blueprint has now an another set of molecules, a handful of set of molecules in the clinic. is a collaboration, a multi-billion dollar collaboration in the oncology space with Roche, um, has several development candidates in its pipeline. And for it really has sort of um, like, I mean, that's as far away as from a single agent, uh, a single asset company as you can imagine, which is very important for investors because even if you work in targeted therapy, um, you do have attrition, and uh, from a value proposition, um, it is much more effective to kind of work on company concept that have that product engine. Why does it matter? Because we are talking about different levels of investment. At Third Rock, we invest usually um, in a Series A, somewhere between 50 and $80 million. Mm -hmm. Okay, Therefore, this is serious. And this is just driven by the belief of a product engine that if your front runner program dies, it's not over as it were in a single asset company, but it's a binary play. You're betting on something, if not there, it's over. But you're not Absolutely. betting with something if it's over or not with $80 million. Mm. And I absolutely understand that. Uh, I mean, um, the binary play with an SPV, you have a project, and if it fails, which um, especially in the early days, the likelihood is very high. Um, I think basically the game is over. When you want to develop a company and uh, bring it to the market, probably uh, it's a much uh, smarter approach uh, to build a portfolio, even if it's difficult, which um, leads me to the question, uh, what about a team? How do you build such a team and what role does a team play when you decide on an, on an investment? I think the, the team is the most important part. Mm -hmm. um, we always talk about it. If you have to choose between an A idea and a B team and between a B idea and an A team, you always pick the A team because mm -hmm. they can make something out of the bad idea or kill it or whatever versus a B team will always screw it up. Okay. <laughs> that, that's, that, that's no question about that. Um, mm -hmm. You always go for the good team, which is a challenge in Europe. I do quite some work uh, in the context of Gold Track program with ERT mm -hmm. and like, you know, uh, in Europe where we try to find gems and like, you know, like nuggets that are somewhere there, those raw diamonds, anywhere in Europe, anywhere in Europe that is. And they do exist and they're exciting. There's exciting science. There's exact, exciting value proposition to solve challenging problems. But um, the team component is a very difficult part in Europe because you don't have those experienced serial entrepreneurs that expertise on that entrepreneurial side um, 
um, even when it comes to management leadership team on the science or whatever, it's, it's difficult to find. I think that's where the U.S. has an advantage. Um, team is super, super important. Is there really such a huge gap between uh, Europe and the United States when it comes to, to understanding how companies can be built? What, what expertise should the people have if they want to pursue an approach which is more um, oriented towards building a portfolio within a company? What, what would you like to see? I mean, I think there are some stereotypic differences. Um, they are partially helpful, partially not, but I think they're telling. Um, one is, of course, the experience of the team. We just discussed that. The other mm -hmm. component is uh, um, that that the benefit focus, okay? Like, you know, why are we doing this? You know, to solve a problem, to make, to make blind people see. Mm -hmm. That is a typical U.S. value proposition. Okay. People who are dead can live again, right? That sort of the European value proposition that's of course is only a stereotype, but it's more like my machine has two extra features, or I can do it like you know in twice as fast, or there's a three percent you know increase in X, okay? And because we are very we are, and I'm part of that too, we are very feature oriented. We are, you know, and that's just the way we think and the way we operate. And I think that that puts us down, holds us back. The opposite is the same true too. It's this North Star. Okay, like this is just like so easy to like, you know, to like believe in a big idea and to go for it and 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 raise the money that's needed in order to get there. Rather than raising as much as you can and then see how far it gets you. Or listening to the feedback for the regulatory agency as they are guiding you in the direction. No, you have to have a plan. You're fighting for that. You'll tell the agency what to do and hope that they will agree with you. Therefore, I think the attitude towards success is just a different one again that's super stereotypic there are like hundreds of exceptions to that but i think it, it is helpful to acknowledge or talk about because it is a is a real thing too i think have i think having a sound vision is uh, is a great thing for a company it's, it's not in the life science field it's um coming from the digital world uh, with shopify uh, this resonated very much with me because uh When I listen to the CEO at Shopify, he says, uh, we want to give everybody the possibility to become an entrepreneur, which I think is a, it's a great North Star. And uh, I see the similar thing as you mentioned also in life science. I mean, we want to cure people, we want to cure cancer, for example. Uh, it's a sound proposition. And uh, I think a vision should, uh, should every company, every team should think about what, what North Star are they following. Uh, you mentioned with, um, uh, with Blueprint Medicine that one company from your portfolio that IPO, then I think uh, that the, the, the research right, uh, Relay Therapeutics also did an IPO in the past. Uh, can you explain a little bit uh, what an IPO is and what role it plays for you as an investor? Yeah, I mean, yeah, you mentioned Relay Therapeutics. I mean, I helped sort of developed the original portfolio and I had the first people in this company and uh, did an IPO last year. I think it's now a, um, a $3 billion dollar company and uh, from a market cap. And um, people look at IPOs, which is the, you know, sort of the going, like ask, becoming a public company, right? To switching from private investment in a venture capital setting into like, you know, um, raising money from the public market and uh um and um there are, there are pros and cons to it like one is the public market is much bigger than a private market um can raise a lot of money that way um but um and that's that's maybe the only or ideal way once you are a mature company in phase three or whatever you can it's very difficult to do it otherwise therefore For us, it's an evolutionary step, and with that comes sort of a certain valuation. There are disadvantages too. You're very scrutinized. Uh, you 
can be, be less less flexible when it comes to goal setting and planning because you have a responsibility towards the public market. Um, therefore, it restricts you to a certain degree, the way you message things, the way you communicate things, the risk you are taking. Um, therefore, it's not always necessarily a good thing uh, from, a, from a company evolu evolution. From the second part of your question of what does it mean for an investor? Many investors see it as an exit uh, to IPO because that's where they very often make a lot of money uh, as they can get out of the company at that point and harvest sort of their fruits. And like, you know, um, um, Relay is a good example that a lot of people got a lot of money, you know. Um, can you imagine that once you now, you're, when you start out with zero and your first round is a 50 million round and you owe like a third of own 90% of that. Uh, and then your company ends up after a couple of financing events and certain dilutions at a $3 billion company, that's all, it's still an enormous, you know, sort of return on that. And that makes uh, Third Rock also the most successful uh, venture capital fund in the world, not only in life sciences. Um, therefore, IPO can be seen as an exit, as an investor, I think, you know, uh, from a from an entrepreneur and a company, it's just another step um, to raise funds as you need them. And um, of course it comes with some, you know, financial reward um, for many people, um, but I, at least for me, that's secondary. I think an IPO is a great thing. Um, uh, your companies, uh, I believe, uh, IPO'd on, on the NASDAQ in the United States. Uh, did, I, did I get it right? Yeah, well, that's, that's what we do because that's sort of, I mean, first our companies are in the US, And secondly, that's, you know, so, so, I mean, this is very clear. You have sort of very clear comparisons in the, in the, in the biotech funds and like on the pharma side. And uh, if, uh, the first is just the best way of doing this rather than London or Paris, for example. Mm. I, mean, I always wondered in, um, I mean, we are now in 2021 and uh, the world is connected, uh, more connected than ever. Uh, when I think back in uh, 80s, 90s, when I started getting interested into the stock market, uh, it was a completely different world. The internet didn't exist initially. Uh, buying stock as a 16, 17 year old, uh, Uh, man in uh, in the mountainous area of Austria mm -hmm. was was a little bit of a challenge, uh, and now we have uh, apps like Robinhood. Um, I think everybody, meanwhile, knows the Nasdaq in the world. When I open the newspaper, I see a lot of uh, hero stories from Europe, from the United States. But one thing um, surprises me. I always thought. Um, when the world gets connected, the importance of uh, putting a company on a certain market like a Nasdaq or like getting listed in London or in Paris becomes less of importance because basically it's uh, every company listed anywhere in the world gets a, gets a number and you can buy it from via your broker. Why is it still so important where the company is listed? What is your opinion on that? I mean, we still have different currencies, right? You know, I mean, there's the euro, there's the dollar. Um, there's of course like the Asian sort of uh, opportunities. Um, I mean, it's just a question of access to investors. Certain investors sit in certain sort of geographies, and uh, I think that makes somewhat of a difference. The, the the fluctuation in the market, the volume, right? You know, I think you know, it's very important, especially for smaller companies. I'm involved in Hukipa, which is originally a company out of Vienna. Uh, but uh, it's listed also in the US now as a public company. I'm a board member there. Um, they, of course, like it's also an incredible success. I mean, it's a super success story being a, you know, several million, hundred million dollar sort of valuation. But of course, they are the fluctuation in the market, as you know, the volume in your sales and buying sort of thing is and um, can be smaller. And that has sort of some impact on your stability and your predictability. And therefore driving for that higher volume and for that kind of thing, especially when you're a good multi-billion dollar company, is not that important. But there are super successful companies are like also in European, like Evotech is listed here, Sanofi is listed in both. Like there's like many hybrids that you can imagine. And I think it's maybe less important. It's just like, you know, geography drives it. The, I mean, Developing a listed company always seems to, tech, I mean, there are technicalities. So it's, it's, it's work and it needs expertise, but basically uh, finding money for a company close to an IPO 
or that is on the market, uh, I think there is there are sufficient funds on the market set up to buy uh, stock from that companies like uh, Cafe Woods Arc Fund, for example. Uh, the problems that I see, especially in Europe, are the early stages of uh, of a company when the technology spun out of a university, when the first team forms, when they think ideally about their North Star, their vision, what they want to achieve with that, um, and money is cars there. Um, lately in Europe, a lot of incubation and acceleration programs started that helped the companies. Um, how is the situation in the United States? Um, what organizations can uh, first-time entrepreneurs who want to get started a company and wants to tap in the f- in the field of expertise, whom can they approach? Yeah, it's um, it's interesting. Um, I always say it's nowhere as easy to raise your first three to five million dollars as it is in Europe. Okay, and you basically they throw it at you. Um, my my opinion. Um, I think that has pros and cons. Mm-hmm. The pro is uh, sort of it drives innovation. It gives you know it, it encourages um, academic scientists, young entrepreneurs, whatever, to take some risk. It's very well buffered. You know, many people don't have to get paid back, and like there's like incredible safety nets around those first five million. In my opinion, very little accountability. Um, I think that helps. That encourages. But of course, what happened afterwards? And that's what you just described, Christian, right? You know, saying like, yeah, there's this scarcity. And then actually that real Series A or that Series B, this is where it's convoluted. Now, not difficult for companies that are successful in that. But then you have a lot of companies that like in those 3 million first funding, whatever, can't get anywhere. And that creates sort of an assessment of, the neighborhoods, then people say like, that's a bad neighborhood. This is like not working. This is ineffective. This is inefficient. Why should I invest? What is my opportunity for an exit? You know, Mm -hmm. I can't, it's not predictable to me, like, especially like angels and so on. Therefore, I think it has also a a somewhat negative effect too. If you compare to the US, getting a first three million is close to impossible. It's really, really difficult. And that select, that drives discipline, that you know encourages you to have a robust business plan, that makes you question things, go forward and backwards, you know, solidify your concept, and with that maybe have a little bit more reliability as you grow up. Therefore, I think those are the pros and cons. They all have their reason. We also live in different uh, political environments. Um, you know, where maybe the U.S. has less of a responsibilities, like they feel at least, towards, you know, subsidizing, you know, ideas or innovation. They are you're more left on your own. Um, in the end, you know, I mean, of course, like, you know, um, the, the biggest successes are now not in Europe. The exceptions, and they are great ones, Ibutech, GenMap, by on tech, you have it. Yeah, amazing success stories. Um, they're just a little bit like less. And um, I'm worried about sort of this um, this almost careless distribution of money that feel my feel more like subsidizing bad ideas than it is actually to to encourage innovation. And I think we need to potentially rethink that a little bit in Europe. Um, how can we be more selective? I'd rather give one company $70 million and it's a good idea than I give 100 companies like $700,000. Okay? And, and 95% of them are bad ideas okay? uh, because it doesn't help anybody. And But I think that requires a willingness and that courage to be judgmental, to be subjective, to, uh, you know, call a dog a dog. And, you know, and um, and maybe we are not bold enough to do that. It's, 
It's awesome to hear that you see advantages in Europe when it comes to money in the early stages over the United States. You always thought it uh, is a little bit different that there is more money on the United States over in all phases of development of companies. And uh, I always thought we, it's only Europe that has a scarcity in that field. But probably you're right with Horizon programs and, and, and other um, public subsidies, um, they make that up but probably also bring a different mindset into the development of a company, which is, uh, how should I call it, uh, without insulting anybody, would say it's not very entrepreneurial because uh, these people are not used to start companies. So what you mentioned as a serial entrepreneur, are not used to start companies and maybe it uh, shapes then the initial phase of a company towards a direction, which ends up culturally at the different spots than the companies we see in the United States, which are driven to be entrepreneurial and focus solely on the market. Um, yeah, and, and, and Christian, we see this a lot. It's a real problem, okay? It, it, mm -hmm. it, it, it really, it, it bothers me because as I mentioned, like Gold Track is one program that I'm very involved in, like in trying to help European companies. You get those early companies and they're already a little screwed up at that point, okay? Like take the cap table as one example. We call it a contaminated cap table. That's what mm -hmm. we internally say. Because they have investors in there, like, you know, the Kreisparkasse Tutling and whatever, <laughs> you know? I mean... Um, That's punk <laughs> Yeah, and like, and I'm not like, this great that they are supportive and like, you know, are like, you know, um, helping innovation. But what's their mindset? Mm -hmm. The mindset of those uh, investors and then potentially board members is that they invest $500,000 and have an obligation to bring $700,000 back, okay? If you then have a conversation with them and say like, we are raising $50 million, the guy you know, freaks out. They not know how to handle it. He's not even permitted to go there, okay? Therefore, because that's a real risk then, okay? And this is, but this is high risk, high return, right? I mean, this this is where the mindset then becomes an issue, where the management teams with the bold ideas get stuck because they got themselves into a situation that's surrounded with people who safeguard and like, you know, and yeah. and and again, I'm not complaining about it because that's those people's job. It just makes it very difficult to then sort of go for you know, where it matters. And like, third of we would never invest in something for $2 million because we have no time for it. Mm. It's like you like picking up like some bottles of empty Coke bottles and Sprite bottles. And, <laughs> and you're like, yeah, I can get like 20 cents for it. It's mm. like, why wouldn't you pick it up? Why don't you pick it up? Because you need to bring it home. You have to carry it. You have to wash it and bring it to the store. And then you get 20 cents. I'm like, ah, forget it. Let's just not go there. Okay, and I think that's a very common thinking of an investor because it's not worth it. They rather like you know sit on the board on ten companies in Boston because mm -hmm. that's the big life science hub, and yeah. they can do this you know, within minutes. They have to travel to Europe to sit on a board, and then it only makes sense if they have a chance to invest twenty or thirty million dollar. Otherwise, it just makes no sense for them. But the crash because the and doesn't allow for that. <laughs> Right. Therefore, I think it's a real thing, and we mm -hmm. forget that as young entrepreneurs, how much we get ourselves in 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 problems that could be avoided if we start out on a different foot. Yeah, I I agree with that. Um, I think it's also the the environment in Europe. Um, the last years, the digital world was very popular and also shaped um, an investment style which is very short-term oriented so as you said you throw a few hundred thousand euros into a company and uh, expect a return within six to twelve months or two or three x which uh, developing an app it's possible a small app put it on the market to get some uh, customers and, and the job is done the life science industry takes uh, 10 to 15 years i think still to put a drug on the market except uh, the vaccines that we saw from from biontech they uh, moved incredibly fast because they already had the 10 to 15 years behind them and brought their platform to a point where this is possible. And it, uh, I think it was one family offices that supported that because in the later stages, uh, there are almost no VCs that invest in that area. 
Um, I think also a point that you expressed, which is uh, life sense important, is also the science and bringing the right people together. I completely agree to that. Um, when I look at your company, I hope I spelled the name right, probably with an Austrian uh, 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 pronunciation, uh, Moma Therapeutics. Uh, when I looked at this company, maybe I got it wrong, but I, it it's, uh, looked to me that there are many third drug venture partners on the board of uh, Moma Therapeutics. Um, and my typical picture of a venture capital company is they invest money and that's it, uh, sit on a board, come uh, every other month to discuss with the uh, with the executives, but don't get their hands dirty. And I got the impression from Third Rock Ventures that you uh, go down a different route. Can you explain a little bit more uh, with the example of Mama Therapeutics, uh, what your approach is? No, I think... Um, um, thanks for the question, because I think what Third Rock does is... is, is very different, but it's Third Rock happened to be the first to do it that way in the US, and now it's a little bit more popular. I mm -hmm. think Third Rock has cultivated this over the last 10 years a lot, and uh, uh, but it's not uncommon anymore. And it is a very different way of uh, approaching that uh, as we, we sort of generally know that. Uh, mm -hmm. Therefore, how does that look like? Um, as I mentioned, there's we invest in companies that we ideate ourselves. We only invest in companies in Boston and San Francisco, because that's where our offices are. Um, and we take ideas from academic founders or self-created and then sort of really play with that. We play with that for a long time, two, three years, spend on average about $2 million on that per company, a huge attrition and that kind of thing, find the right teams, um, mull it over and over again of so this principle of group genius. And then two or three years later, then we launch a company. And that's where we then invest. We invest very aggressively, usually between 50 and $80 million. And, um, but that's not the end of it. Uh, we actually go in there as partners from Third Rock in the key leadership management functions. CEO, CSO, chief business officer, uh, chief people office, uh, whatever you have it. And usually two or three of us. And we really sort of with that can leverage the knowledge that we have having built now 55 companies. Um, we can leverage the infrastructure that Third Rock provides and we provide the leadership to the company. It's like having training wheels on your on the bike. And um, that gives it a more stable start uh, people can focus on the science um, and um, we help with telling the story. We sort of build a company in a robust way, stay in this for one to three years in that leadership role as we feel it's then appropriate to take off the training wheels, bring in a permanent leadership team then at that time and stay on in the company as board members. And for that sort of the, the concept of building a company Third Rock has a lot of experience with it, a lot of safeguards with it, a lot of cultural components uh, with it um, to warrant they, they get it going on the, on the right foot. And uh, um, um, that is a different concept. If, uh, to answer your question or a comment, is you're not only bringing money to the table. Maybe that's actually the least important part that we bring. We are bringing enormous experience and leadership. We are bringing the passion towards that new company concept. Be it Celsius and single cell anesthesia, being MoMA uh, in um, uh, ATPs as molecular machines, both companies where I co-founded. Both companies have been CSO. Celsius a year and a half in MoMA now for a year, but then like three years incubation prior to that. If we stay with those companies and once we let go, once we have the permanent leadership team and the trust in that team to be the ones that can drive this forever, we go back and sort of provide more strategic guidance at, at board members. That's a very interesting approach. So basically you cover the, the whole value chain when it comes uh, to investing in a company. You go in extremely early. So in a situation where no team exists, um, bring your expertise and your know-how into the company as well as the money. Then build the team around the idea. 
and then make the shift from uh, being in the driver's seat back to a more uh, coaching or mentoring-like approach or like the typical investment approach, which uh, is very amazing. From Europe, I, I see different organizations that's different um, different um, uh, positions in the, in the value chain and you cover everything. Um, when I look on the scientific side, um, I mean, now the mRNA vaccines are very, uh, very famous and very popular. Uh, how important for you still, I mean, we talked about the vision, we talked about the right team, getting the A team, but how important to you is also get, getting the A technology that nobody else is currently developing? Or uh, do you think it's also okay to say, okay, it's a Me Too product, so now mRNA vaccines are on the market, now we also develop some. Uh, what What is the position that... Uh, that you pursue? Yeah, I mean, third rock, we, uh, we don't like to be the follow-ons. I mean, that's just a philosophical question. Mm -hmm. I think there's enormous value proposition in sort of being second. I mean, uh, we see this a lot being an mRNA, being one example, like, you know, but like in the antibody space, IO, right? I mean, there was one IO company, at one immune oncology company at one point, now there are thousands, therefore what's wrong with it? Um, it's, it's okay. Therefore, it's just not what we do, okay? This is not the judgment. This is just way we approach it. We want to be on that beginning of innovation. We love disruptive companies. We, um, we want to take a lot of risk um, because I think, you know, that's just, um, but we want to do it always very much found, found in a foundation that's highly scientific. And uh, um, that's just our approach, but like it's not necessarily the only the right approach. It's just that we will like it because want to be innovative and disruptive. I mean, one question I just saw that came in, it was about like in the third rock setting, I think, you know, you know, was like, what type of ownership do we usually go in, right? There's also a big difference between Europe and the US. In Europe, I see often companies where founders have 90% of the company. They're like three founders and together they have like, you know, 85, 90%, like each of them 30 or 40%. Like, like this, this is totally like not the case in the US, okay? Um, in the U.S., as a founder, you might have like between one and five percent. Um, that's that's sort of the U.S. because you put a lot of money in there, okay? And uh, that's just sort of that's where the risk then is, and you're not done when you start a company. Um, therefore, that's very different. Now, that makes as a founder your the slice of the pie much smaller in the U.S., but very often the pie is really big, right? You know, I mean, I, I co-founded like, you know, Thrive Earlier Detection uh, 18 months ago. Um, we raised $265 million, but sold this generally the company to Exact Sciences for $2.5 billion. But that's a pretty, pretty big pie. You know, for, they are, it's okay for a co-founder to like only have a percent or two. It's still like a shitload of money, okay? Um, I think that's better than having 50% in the company that in the end is, is, is worth nothing. <laughs> okay. And I think that is a good thing to answer the question. Um, with that in mind, we, if we are the sole investor in it, we very often have the 90% of the company because we also ideated it. And then an exit, we very often still have about 50% of the company. And that, of course, from an entrepreneurial perspective, is a very good scenario in case you're successful. And uh, basically, you, with your approach, you are the founders yourself. So basically, I mean, you you bring a, a lot, a lot to the table. Not only the money, but the discussion I have very often uh, with companies in Europe um, this this dilution problem that some people have. And uh, which leads to interesting uh, valuations on the other hand, when somebody demands um, 50 million investments and uh, wants to have 90% of the company uh, as a founder. Um, I like the example of Jeff Bezos with Amazon. I mean, I think uh, he owned at the end 11% of the company and still was the, the richest person on the planet with one of the most valuable companies. Um, so I completely agree to your example and I like it that... Uh, it always depends uh, on the size of the pie. So a uh, smaller chunk from a bigger pie is, uh, is more than a big chunk of a small pie. 
when it comes, you mentioned uh, the company Thrive Earlier Detection, which I think is very interesting um, when we look now at the later phases of development of a company. Um, what about the commercialization? How does it work in the industry? Is it... Um, but what is your approach? Do you do you try to to cover also the value chain up to the patient that you bring the drugs yourself to the market, or uh, do do you see more potential in uh, really pursuing B two B approaches to say, okay, we just take the first steps in the development and then sell it off to the industry? How is the industry set up today? Yeah, I think it it depends. Uh, all those flavors exist. Uh, depends also on the area, right? Like Thrive earlier detection is. Uh, is a diagnostics company where we had this vision that uh, um, on an annual blood draw, um, we can tell people if they have cancer or not. Mm -hmm. It could be anywhere in the body. And we treated now, tested that now on 10,000 patients and it works. Uh, incredible value proposition because early cancer detection will save lives. Uh, um, this will change the way we think about cancer. It will take out the uh, angst about cancer in a significant way and uh, um, exact sciences saw that. And it's a good example to your question because why did we agree on the acquisition? Um, I mean, yes, so they paid $2.1 billion like, you know, straight up that day, $400 million sort of in, in future milestones. Um, but uh, there's no bio box in that, right? I mean, it's like, you know, a little bio box. It's $2.1 billion right, at, at closer closing this thing, which we did in January. Um, why did we agree on that? Not because of the money, because that's unimportant, okay? It's like, what is the biggest chance to bring this test to, to people? And in the diagnostic space, this is tough. And you need to have all the primary care physician, you have to have it integrated on the medical record side. It's a Salesforce question, whatever. Um, us as a young company, Thrive, we are, was 18 months old. We can't stem that. We just cannot build this. We need... To raise more money, the alternative would have been an IPO. Um, um, this is this tricky. Exact provided that infrastructure. We established the Cologuard as a colon cancer test sort of out in the market. They have Salesforce, they have the primary care physician connection. They are integrated in Epic, you know, in the, in the medical systems on the record side. Um, this is what we need. We don't need to build it. We can focus on our thing. It's the best chance to bring it forward. I think that's true for all companies. Uh, like the Third Rock, about half of our companies did IPOs. About half of them got into merger and acquisitions um, um, as companies such as buying it, integrating it into their thing. Therefore, exist in all flavors. Also in drug discovery, some of them only do discovery or development. Some of them go all the way, fully integrated, also commercialization. Totally depends. I mean, Blueprint is now a commercial company. Um, I mean, um, in sales over all geographies and uh, um, other companies um, are not doing that, but stay more like on the discovery innovation side. Um, totally depends uh, really on, on um, the market, on the field, on the concept of the company and also what happens. I mean, companies are not sold. Companies are bought, right? You know, if I think as an entrepreneur, you never think about selling a company, in my opinion, okay? Because it happens on you. It's not something that you, I think, should plan for. I know that's very controversial, but that's my opinion. Uh, but um, when you get bought, they get bought. Uh, I, I was... It, it's absolute. I agree to that, and, and I like it. I hear that so rarely these days that entrepreneurs build company companies and this is what we are doing um more and more often when i talk with uh first-time entrepreneurs or young entrepreneurs the first thing they mention is uh, i think after 10 minutes in the talk is uh, the exit that they want to build a company for three to five years and then exit the company so it, it is not entrepreneurial spirit <laughs> you don't uh, exit your company you build it and uh if the circumstances are right and if it makes sense for the technology and for the product to hand it over to a bigger partner it makes sense but uh, you don't plan as an entrepreneur as, uh, as an exit this is investor thinking and i really like to to hear uh the spin from your side that you say you build company and companies are bought not sold this is this is uh sound the sound in my my, my ears yeah i think that's it's the truth <laughs>
I think this is uh, it comes back to the to the to the mindset thinking. Um, but I do understand also this side when people start when when they see the money. It's uh, recently I wrote an article about uh, valuations. I wondered what the how many trillion dollar companies we have in the world currently, and um, the first five um, hit a couple of years ago. This trillion. Uh, dollar market cap milestone and interestingly the first company was a chinese company already in 2007 8 um, an oil company and when we read these numbers in the newspapers and on the internet that uh, this company has that market capitalization and what bought for billions of uh, dollars i understand that uh, some people also want to have so much money on their bank accounts um, so valuation sort of uh, drives the expectations, and I was wondering um, how how the valuations are in our industry. Uh, what you see in the United States, what can investors in life science companies, uh, when they do the job right, uh, expect on the valuation side? Um, is one trillion a, a reasonable valuation, or are we in a different space? How do you see it? Yeah, I think there's been a lot of changes over the last few years, actually, recently also. I mean, I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, diagnostics, we thought that's just not a value proposition to invest in outside of the angel world, right? I mean, mm -hmm. this is where VCs just didn't go into because, like, they thought, like, the return is just not there. That, I think, was still a popular position, uh, maybe, I would say, maybe two or three years ago. This has changed. I mean, I... We just talked about an uh, example I was involved in with Thrive, you know, $2.5 billion. Uh, Illumina um, offered to buy Grail, which is another diagnostics company. It doesn't have a product on the market. And uh, the offer was $8 billion. Mm -hmm. uh, we have Freenom out there, Archer DX. We have Foundation Medicine, which is a company that we built at Third Rock um, that was eventually bought by, by Roche for whatever, a couple billion dollars. Therefore, we are seeing now in the diagnostic space those billion-dollar companies, and that's not done. I mean, Exact Sciences uh, bought us is a is a company that has you know um, a couple of tests on the market, and uh, its 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 valuation right now is uh, twenty-two billion dollar. Therefore, mm -hmm. I mean, we are seeing there's not a diagnostic space where we couldn't see it before. I think we'll see something else or um, soon in the data side, on the data side. Um, data companies right now, this was like jokes, right? You know, um, this is changing. Flat iron being one example when they were bought by Roche. Uh, um, 23andMe, I mean, the, you know, companies that tell you that they're related to Chinggis Khan, you know, are now billion dollar companies. I mean, yeah. therefore, I mean, there is, I, I think, partially because there's value in the data, okay? And there is important things that like stay with you and like, you know, that um, therefore we think we will see it there. Um, and of course, in the truck companies, another good example. Uh, uh, there it's easy because you can predict your, your your sale and it's totally clear that the blueprints and relays of the world like uh, three to five billion dollar companies. Um, but 10 years ago, we didn't expect that for the genzymes of the world that work in rare genetic diseases where there are only 100 people to be treated. We thought that's a total joke, right? Uh, but those companies... Um, uh, ended up uh, being um, Biomarine, uh, Alexion, um, Genzyme being you know, multi-billion dollar companies. Uh, um, and I, 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 as long as it relates towards benefit, and as long as it relates towards value-based medicine, mm -hmm. I think it's absolutely appropriate. Where it gets convoluted is if, if this actually is driven by pricing only that restricts access to medicines, then I'm getting my problem with it. Okay, therefore, I think we need to look at it carefully, differentiate, um, and uh, hopefully there will be some sanity at one point to it that's really sort of driven by yeah, value rather than by perceived value or like really sort of driven by the financial industry. Yeah, I wonder how, how the future will look like. I mean, with the SARS-CoV-2 
two topic in the last year, I think the pharma industry got uh, a lot of more attention from investors that are not familiar with the industry. And when I look on the political side, um, I think in the United States, uh, one 1.9 trillion bailout program was uh, signed off by Trump and the second one by Biden uh, this year. And I think also the European recovery program is about $1.8 trillion. Uh, I wonder what effect this will have also on the valuation of the, of the not listed uh, companies. Do you see an impact in the industry uh, because of the sheer amount of uh, money that is currently flooding uh, on the worldwide market? Yeah, I mean, it's like sometimes it scares me a little bit, right? And of course, we are happy that... Uh, innovation gets so much attention and there's so much capital right now available. I mean, you see the IPOs rising, SPACs mm -hmm. as a vehicle that was really seen as something that people don't want to touch. It was like really something ugly and like, you know, not you want to be affiliated with it. Now it becomes just a thing. Um, therefore, uh, I mean, right now it's, I think partially the, evaluation, the valuations are crazy and inappropriate. Um, we will see that. Just had a conversation with an investor from the crossover side. Those are investors that invest in private companies right before they go public. Um, and they specialize in that space. And they are worried, right? Because we will see there will be enormous attrition. And like a lot of money invested will get felt got lost. Okay. And that we'll see that. And people are like, oh, it's an unpredictable like space, and we shouldn't invest in apartment complexes in China. Because I know at least they'll exist then, you know, when they are built, right? I mean it's like I think versus in drug discovery, you might not know that or in life sciences. And therefore I think that that we will get that clarity again in the next five, six years, as many of those investments will not pan out. And I think it will reset. Maybe it resets earlier, we never know. Maybe it resets tomorrow. Okay. Uh, right now, the market is open. Uh, the market is like there's capital is available. People should take advantage of it for a good idea. I think that's okay. Just like let's be prepared for a, one day reality will hit us again and people are like, hey, not all of those ideas we invested in actually are panning out. And uh, I think it will shock some, okay? And we um, have to see, it's just part of the game. Yeah, as long as um, people understand that still, uh, also for portfolio companies, there is still a high risk, especially in the early stages of development. And that the odds of uh, losing an investment is probably higher than in other industries. So it's just scientific risk. Uh, besides, uh, if even if the team it does everything right and has the vision set up, um, it might always be that the technology just uh, doesn't prove what they were hoping for in the clinical development. And uh, most of the time, especially the smaller the companies, uh, that might be the end of the investment. Uh, for the valuation reset, I'm waiting for it since um, the last market crash in 2008. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I hear it every year when you open the newspaper. Every, every year I heard valuation reset is coming. Now we are in 2021. Last year I thought that's it. And then the market got an upward swing, which was incredible. Uh, what, what's your expectation? Just look a little bit uh, in the future. What's your expectation? When will we see such a valuation reset? I don't know. And I think that's the most appropriate answer. Um, mm. It's very unpredictable. Now, having said that, over the last 10 years, right, to your point, Christian, we also had a lot of success as an industry. And mm. I mean, it's absolutely fantastic. And if you think about it, like, there's a new disease showing up. It's one of the most aggressive viruses that we have ever seen. Mm -hmm. And we have no idea what it was on day one. And 18 months later, half of the European population and like two thirds of the American population is vaccinated, vaccinated against what we didn't be able to describe a year and a half earlier. That is, that is fantastic. This is, this is, this is insane. If I think what we can do today. And how much suffering we can take care of and which diseases we are able to cure influence. I mean, this industry deserves investment and should be rewarded for that risk it's taking. If I think it is actually 
appropriate, okay? Now, where that will get us to, I do not know because that influenced by a lot of factors. And a lot of people were wrong in 2008 and a lot of people were right. <laughs> and a lot of people predicted that we will have 12 years to come that are fantastic and fruitful. And a lot of people predicted this will be like much shorter than that. Yeah. We have no idea. You know, prepare for all scenarios. What worries me is a different question in that, which is something that uh, I think um, we are not enough paying enough attention to, and it has to do with uh, access to medicines. It's with uh, distribution of medicines, with uh, pricing of drugs. Um, there we are getting ourselves into a situation that I think is not sustainable. Mm. Pricing is done by reference to old pricing. It's not done by value-added medicine. It doesn't exist. England is trying to do this to a certain degree. Mm. Um, but um, uh, it's a conversation that I think COVID is introducing to the normal people, which I like. Because people say, like, wait a second, there's a there's a small percentage of chances that there's blood clotting when I take it. Why am I taking this? You know, I mean, people should ask, by the way, how much is it compared to one that doesn't do it? That okay. pricing question we are not having it, but at least we are starting to have a conversation about um, choices, about who is making for us a decision of which medicine to have or not. Interesting, that's very often the government, which is like, you know, you know its own conversation but that this you would never do this with your car <laughs> you would never accept that a government tells you which car to drive because it's less polluting the environment or because it's a little safer or because you would not tolerate that you're like i'm buying the car that i want and i pay for this what i think is appropriate why don't we do this with medis okay I mean, it's like, it's like very absurd, right? We still live in this world of like, just like sucking it up. And if I think we need innovation in that space, I started a company like with several other people who are much smarter about that in that space mm -hmm. on truck pricing. It's called EQRX. We'll try to revolutionize uh, truck pricing in that and charge 10% to 20% of what everybody else charges on trucks by being more efficient in the truck discovery and development and commercialization process. We think that will disrupt the, the, the thing. And what makes me optimistic is that people say that's a good idea. That people say access to medicine must be one of our most important priorities. That this is a global problem. That this is a societal problem. That is something we need to work on. That medicines are not made for the rich but medicines are made for everybody. And that our system is not set up to do that right now. That access is becoming the biggest problem that we have in healthcare. And that the cost regulation of that is intimately related to it. And somebody needs to do something. Mm -hmm. And I'm extremely thankful, like, you know, we raised the Series A, $250 million last January. This January, we raised the Series B, $500 million on that concept that I described. And that makes me optimistic because that means that investors, and we talked a lot about money today, but in investors see that value-based medicine, that access, that fair distribution, that this might be as important as anything else we do in that space and that they are willing to take risk and financial risk, you know, on top of that in order to help companies that want to change that. It's a, it's a sound vision. Um, I think in the last year, I mean, I was not planning for a pandemic, uh, so it came out of nowhere. And um, what you said at the beginning um, of the last five minutes, um, the level of collaboration internationally in the last 12 months, it was just astonishing. So, I mean, I, I think I, I never saw that before that uh, Chinese and European companies and uh, US companies are working together to solve the problems around, around these threats to get a better understanding how, um, how severe it really is uh, to develop vaccines in an amazing speed. Um, I mean, it's just, as you said, it's just one year. But what scares me a little is uh, not only the distribution um, of medicine worldwide, so the 
it's not uh, a medicine for the rich only. Um, what scares me a little bit is also when I open the newspaper that with the pandemic also poverty starts rising again. And uh, usually poverty hits uh, the young people very hard. And uh, I think besides this uh, solving the distribution of medicine, we should also think a little bit on how, how, how solving the poverty problem. And I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a problem of education and uh, financial literacy so that uh, people also get uh, proper training, which uh, I even don't see it in the Western world. So especially in Europe, I think financial literacy is, uh, is still a problem and which at the end of the day also leads uh, so the beginning of uh, of health problems, uh, how how do you see the the, the connection between medicine and, and poverty and uh, and education? Well, I think it's a, it's very direct and it's extremely important. Um, I think there's a lot of room for improvement in that, and it's super necessary. And I think you know, as you mentioned, it's like I think some of that we are learning when it impacts us and yeah. um, if there's a good thing about COVID that that's one of them that I think it raises awareness and gets us a better understanding how important the work is, how heroic the efforts of our scientists and entrepreneurs in that space. They're not just people who are making money. They're not just people who are crazy scientists and have like, you know, silly ideas that potentially one day could. Those are the real heroes, I think. And if we can now facilitate that actually access and distribution is fair. I guess that's our next challenge for the next 10 years. This, and uh, in that finance, literacy, um, social awareness, education, um, is super, super important. We have our work cut out, tell you. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Let me ask you uh, one final question. So as you said, we were talking a lot about money. We were talking about the impact our industry makes uh, on the world and that uh, more and more people got aware of how important it is. Um, I mentioned the ARC Fund earlier of, of Kathy Wood and uh, she has put out her Big Ideas report in January where she's uh, saying that in her opinion, I mean, you mentioned how important the vision is and uh, the team is. Um, and in her opinion, the area that thrives the most in our industry might be, uh, she calls it the genomics revolution. So she uh, talks about gene editing, um, everything around that. And uh, believes that this will shape uh, the next 10 years. Uh, what is your opinion uh, when you look at the technology that we are aware of today, uh, in which direction should entrepreneurs look when they put together their vision? What might drive our industry in the next 10 years or what might drive it forward? Yeah, no, I agree with that assessment. I think for the next 10 years, it's pretty predictable. I continue to believe that uh, we're not done with the genomic revolution. If you want an example, we have not brought personalized medicine to autoimmune diseases. Mm -hmm. We have personalized medicine because of our genomics understanding in oncology, made dramatic differences. Um, it has not hit cardiovascular, it has not hit autoimmune. Um, those are big drivers. Um, um, and I think they will see a lot. Uh, I'm interested in like 20 years because the 10 years are all impacted by things that we're already having, right? Okay. Now. Okay. But that is pretty clear and pretty easy to predict. I think it's much harder to think about it and more fun to think about it 20 years from now. And I think there will be significant impact by a better access to medical records and data. Mm -hmm. I think they are, we are like nowhere <laughs> because our medical records are built on on. on on IT systems that were made for reimbursement, for billing, okay? If, uh, that's why we have them as hospitals, because somebody needs to charge for their medicine. And that's really how we are set up from an IT infrastructure, not because of learning from data, understanding, you know, things, uh, tax, uh, tox, uh, uh, toxicity of drugs, uh, um, um, proneness uh, for things, prediction of diseases, early detection, I think they will see a lot based on data 
And that is so important because the impact of that, data themselves are worth less, the impact of that will be in prevention and early detection of disease. Yeah. Uh, and I think in the next 20 years, I think that's where it's going, that we detect cancer early, that we are avoiding cardiovascular and obesity, that we are you know, working on sort of you know, catching psoriasis prior to having it. And like, I think, you know, this, I think, well, is the next big revolution, at least that, that's the one I, I'm hoping for. I was hoping it, it, it's faster than 20 years. So when I see in other industry, what's already possible when uh, we start connecting data, um, I think it will be heaven for, for scientists to get a uh, big, big, uh, big data on a big scale to understand and learn better how, how diseases work and how they develop and how we can stop that. Do you, you say this in German? Dein Wort in Gottes Wort. <laughs> yeah, I hope it's speed up. Uh, Christoph, um, thank you very much for this very interesting talk. Um, I wish you and your team uh, of Third Rock Ventures all the best and uh, hope that you keep picking up great ideas, putting together great teams and help uh, also the medicine to develop worldwide and being available to everybody on the planet. It, it's a sound vision. I like it. Thank you very much. I would say inshallah, right? <laughs> which means so God will. Thank you. Thanks for the conversation. Have a great day. Bye. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Please, please share the podcast and make sure you've subscribed. Have a great day. Mm -hmm.